This episode is sponsored by CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers. The first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash biographics and use the promo code biographics. You might never have heard of German chemist Fritz Haber, but there is a 50% chance that you owe your very existence to this man's invention. The process he designed to convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia made it possible to produce fertilizers on a large scale, ensuring much more plentiful harvests than ever before in the history of mankind, and therefore saving billions of people from starvation. It is estimated that the food base of half the current world's population is based on his Harbour Bosch process. This achievement granted Dr. Harbour the highest of accolades, the Nobel Prize for Chemistry, in 1918. And yet, there is a darker side to this benefactor of humanity. A story of family abuse, of suicide, of blind loyalty taken to the extreme, and the first ever use of weapons of mass destruction on a battlefield. This is the story of how Fritz Haber, the Jewish scientist, unwittingly created the ultimate weapon that brought about the Holocaust. The story of Fritz Haber has been described as worthy of a Greek tragic hero, featuring from its very first years all of the ingredients of a classic tragedy. Father and son in relationship conflicts, the early shadow of death and hubris, and then of course, there's the explosives. Fritz Haber was born on December 9, 1868 in Breslau, Prussia, now Wroclaw in Poland. His parents, Siegfried and Paula, were both members of a wealthy Jewish family established in the area since the early 1800s. To be more precise, they were members of the same family. They were, in fact, first cousins who had married against the will of their relatives. Harbour's life had barely started when it was already struck by tragedy. His mother died from complications only three weeks after childbirth. His father, Siegfried, he was devastated, leaving Fritz in the care of relatives. As a consequence, the two grew cold and distant, and their relationship it never really recovered. When his son was six, Siegfried remarried and had three daughters, Elsie, Helen, and Frieda, with whom Fritz actually got along with well. But the life of Fritz it was to be shaped by his own ambitions, rather than the influence of his family. He had the ambition to master science from an early age, and the ambition to prove that he was first a German and then a Jew. He was ready to serve his Kaiser and his recently unified fatherland. After completing high school in 1886, Fritz declined an offer to become an apprentice at his father's dye company. The two men they frequently clashed and simply could not work together. Instead, Fritz applied to study chemistry in Berlin, earning his doctorate cum laude in 1891. Having achieved a doctorate in less than five years was already impressive enough. Moreover, Fritz had to interrupt his studies for one year of compulsory military service in an artillery regiment. This was to be his first experience with the explosive power of modern warfare. Siegfried Haber made another attempt to involve his son Fritz in the family business, but their personalities uh, they just weren't compatible. Fritz sought instead an outlet for his ambition in academia, starting as an independent assistant at the University of Jena from 1892 to 1894. It was a Jena that he decided to convert from Judaism to Lutheranism. Haber belonged to one of the first generations of Jewish citizens to hit the labor market after the unification of Germany. He experienced a variety of options and opportunities that were not available to their predecessors. And yet, young Jewish men like Fritz, they still felt the need to convert in order to progress in their careers and prove that they were truly German patriots. Haber's career, it indeed flourished. In 1894, he moved to the University of Karlsruhe, published two chemistry treaties, and escalated through the ranks, becoming professor at the age of just 38. It was at the University of Karlsruhe between 1894 and 1911 that Fritz Haber invented and developed what became known as the Haber-Bosch process. Let me explain this step by step. The use of nitrogen-based fertilizers to increase production of agricultural crops had already been in use for decades, but these fertilizers were expensive as they relied on imports of sodium nitrate from South American countries, mostly Chile. And so where exactly do you find sodium nitrate? Well, that would be in guano, or in other words, bird crap. 
Yep, that's right. The economy of entire countries depended on bird crap, and yes, wars were fought over it. And yet nitrogen? Well, nitrogen is one of the most common elements in the atmosphere. Indeed, it makes up 80% of the air we breathe. The genius of Haber's invention was to fixate nitrogen to hydrogen under extreme conditions of pressure. This resulted in ammonia, which would then become the main ingredients for cheap and efficient fertilizers, which we still use today. The consequences of this invention, they've changed the world as we know it. Before the Harbour Bosch process, the world's population had plateaued at about a billion people, and this was due to the inability to produce enough food for everybody. But the new fertilizers, they were going to change that. Fritz Haber's process to the growth and sustainability of the world's population is such that it has been estimated that the food base of about half the world's current population derives from the Haber Bosch process. This invention, it was hailed as a miracle, and it was described by its contemporaries as Brot aus der Luft, or bread from the air. Three years went by, and Harbour's endeavours they were about to change as Germany and the whole of Europe rushed towards war. In the autumn of 1914, Harbour enthusiastically volunteered to put his science in the service of the Ministry of War. He needed the right experience at the right time. After Germany had invaded Belgium in August, causing the British Empire to declare war, the Royal Navy had launched a blockade on German ports to slowly choke the Kaiser's war industry. Explosives, just like fertilizers, they relied on heavy quantities of nitrogen to be produced, which of course at that time still required massive amounts of bird crap from Chile. But with the British blockade, the explosive factories they soon ran out of supplies. As a result, the German artillery could have been left without ammunition after only six months of war. This, this is where Fritz Haber enters the picture. During peacetime, he said, a scientist belongs to the world, but during wartime, he belongs to his country. His first achievement was to adapt the Haber Bosch process to the production of explosives, many of which are nitrogen based compounds. It's fascinating how this element can be used to both raise crops and also cause such destruction. But Fritz Haber, now Lieutenant Haber, he had higher ambitions. Eager to prove again that he was a true German and a true patriot, he approached the high commands with a new proposal. This proposal was the weaponization of chemicals to break the stalemate of trench warfare on the Western Front. Thursday, the 22nd of April 1915, British and Canadian troops are entrenched in their positions facing the German lines on the Ypres salient in western Belgium. All appears quiet to the Allied observers for most of the day. Until that is, at exactly 5 pm, a gentle westward breeze starts blowing in their direction. But today's wind is carrying a strange mist which seems to build up and thicken yard after yard. Some soldiers notice how birds caught in the cloud in mid-air simply stop flapping their wings and drop like stones to the ground. The cloud, now a rolling toxic wall of intangible death, causes even the leaves and blades of grass to shrivel and die. On this day, the 22nd of April 1915 at 5 p.m., the German Imperial Army launched a surprise attack against the Allied trenches. Their secret weapon? 5,700 cylinders containing 150 tons of chlorine gas. The mastermind behind the attack? Lieutenant Fritz Haber. He had come to the front to personally supervise the opening of the valves that would unleash the first successful use of a weapon of mass destruction on a battlefield. A British soldier left an account of what happened when the cloud of chlorine reached the Allied positions. It reads, A living wall of green fog about four feet in height moved towards the French line and spread out to a width of about 180 meters. As the wall of smoke grew higher, the whole area disappeared into it. Suddenly, the rifle fire from the French increased, but gradually died down. Soon we heard strange shouts coming from the green fog. The cries became weaker and more incoherent. Then masses of soldiers tumbled upon us from out of the fog and collapsed. Most weren't wounded, but they had expressions of terror on their faces. The effects of chlorine gas on the body that is plain nasty. The gas causes acute inflammation of the eyes, nose, throat, and lungs, to which the body's immune system reacts with an overproduction of mucus. Soon the airways clog up and you're left gasping for a breath that will never come. It's like drowning on dry land. Was Fritz Haber in any way concerned about the ethics of chemical warfare? Well, apparently not, as he was quoted as saying, death is death, no matter how it is inflicted. Although the battle ended in a stalemate typical of the Western Front, Harbour's contribution and initial gas attack was considered a complete success, and he was rewarded with a promotion to captain and some days of leave away from the front. 
But was he away from the pain and the misery and the death? Well, not really. But before I get into Harbour's life, I do want to mention a quick word from our sponsor for this episode, CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a subscription streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. You can get unlimited access, starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first 30 days are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com forward slash biographics and use the promo code biographics, all one word, lowercase. If you're looking for a specific recommendation, for me on that platform. Uh, I would recommend the History of Food, which talks a lot about the revolution of agriculture and some about what we talk about in this video. Or if you want something a bit more, well, miserable, and I know you do because I know which videos do well on this channel, well, you can watch Hitler's Miracle Weapons. Now, all their docs are great watches, though, and they're all available in that free trial. It's available on lots of platforms, Roku, Android, Xbox One, Smart TVs, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Kindle, and Apple TV, and is also available worldwide. Again, go to curiositystream.com forward slash biographics for unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series. And for our listeners, enter the promo code biographics when prompted during the sign-up process, and your membership is completely free for the first 30 days. And let's get back to it. Now, at this point, we do need to stop for a moment and rewind and take a closer look at another character in our story who's often overlooked in life and, well, almost forgotten in death. She is Fritz's wife, Clara Imavar. Clara's life mirrored in many ways the life of her husband. She, too, was born into a Jewish family from Breslau in 1870 from parents who were first cousins, and just like Fritz, she then converted to Christianity at the age of 27. But more significantly, Clara was also a chemist, and a brilliant one at that. Overcoming societal pressures and the unfairness of a patriarchal society that disapproved of women scientists, Clara had enrolled in the Breslau University, earning a doctorate summa cum laude in 1900. She became the first German woman to be awarded a PhD in chemistry. Clara and Fritz, they met for the first time in 1890 at a dancing lesson, and they fell in love, and then Fritz proposed to her shortly thereafter. But unusually for that time, Clara had declined the offer as she first wanted to establish her own financial and personal independence. Fritz, he did not give up, and he continued his courtship, which culminated in their marriage in 1901. Their only son, Hermann, he was born the following year. According to one of Harbour's biographers, Dietrich Stolzenberg, their union was a happy and successful one. Fritz was deeply in love with Clara and took every occasion to dote on her as well as their child, but not everybody agreed with that. Clara herself confided to a friend that her life grew more miserable as time went on, as she put it, The main reason for that was Fritz's oppressive way of putting himself first in our home and marriage so that a less ruthlessly self-assertive personality was simply destroyed. Their marriage, it soon was in crisis. Barber was seldom at home and made his disdain for her scientific endeavors quite clear. He went on frequent trips with colleagues and even had affairs with other women. In a letter to her old mentor, Professor Abegg, Clara had even complained that Fritz's gains and scientific successes had been her loss. The fact is that Clara Imavar was not suited to the traditional subservient role assigned to housewives in the early 20th century. She was a feminist, firmly believing that a woman's intellect was by no means inferior to a man's, and yet, even though she actively contributed to her husband's research on fertilizers, her work it went uncredited. In later years, she was confined to translating into English Fritz's scientific papers. Clara was also a staunch pacifist, and had denounced from the outset the madness of the Great War. When Fritz started contributing to the war effort by using his Harbour Bosch process to produce explosives, she was appalled and openly opposed his work, denouncing it as a perversion of the ideals of science and a sign of barbarity, corrupting the very discipline which ought to bring new insights into life. Then, when her husband enthusiastically dedicated himself to the application of chemical warfare, well, this was the final straw to the fragile balance of their marriage and to her own psyche. According to Stolzenberg, she had a family history of depression, and Clara herself may have suffered from it too. So she desperately pleaded with Fritz to cease working with the military, but instead of dealing with her views in private, his angry reaction was to denounce her in public of making statements that were treasonous to the fatherland. Alright, so now let's go back to those fateful days after the Battle of Ypres. Captain Fritz Haber is being celebrated by the German Imperial Army High Command for his success with chlorine, and he's now about to leave for another mission on the Eastern Front. This mission? 
Well, now it was the Russians' turn to drown on dry land. Nobody can tell what happened exactly on May 2, 1915, but we know at least some of the facts. Clara and Fritz have another argument. It may have been sparked by the role he played in Ypres or the news that he was going to repeat his exploits against the Russians. That night, while he is sleeping, Clara walks into their garden carrying Fritz's service sidearm, a Luger 9mm. A single shot rings out. Herman, Clara and Fritz's only child and aged 13, runs into the garden to find his mother slowly dying from a self-inflicted pistol shot to the chest. Clara dies in Herman's arms. And what did Captain Harbour do? Well, he just left. He was due on the Eastern Front to release more gas on Germany's enemies, and so he left the very next morning, leaving Herman to grieve alone. Clara's surname, Imavar, in German means always true. Perhaps it was her desire to stay always true to her beliefs that led to her taking her own life. As per Fritz, why did he leave his son alone in that terrible moment? Was it his sense of extreme duty and loyalty to the fatherland? Was it unwillingness to cope with the responsibility of his wife's suicide? Well, we'll never really know. For the rest of his life, Harbour never discussed any of the details of Clara's death. On May the 8th, a lone obituary in a newspaper reported on the suicide of the wife of Dr. H of the Secret Service, who is currently at the front, adding that the reasons for the unhappy woman's act are not known. Harbour remarried two years later with Charlotte Nathan and had two children, Eva and Lutz. Harbour's first son, Herman, never approved of this union and grew further and further apart from his father and his new family. Herman did not have a happy life. He moved to the USA shortly before the outbreak of World War II, and in 1946, he too committed suicide. His own daughter, Claire, was a chemist employed by the US government to research an antidote for chlorine gas. When her research project was shut down in favor of work on the atomic bomb, she too for a third time in three consecutive generations, committed suicide. Germany's defeat in November of 1918 was a devastating blow for Captain Harbour, who was now Professor Harbour once again. That year, however, brought him a much-needed piece of good news. His invention of the Harbour-Bosch process was selected by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences as winner for that year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The official motivation being for the synthesis of ammonia from its elements. Now, it had been common for scientists of both sides during the war to serve in their respective countries' chemical warfare units. Future Nobel laureates James Frank, Gustav Hertz, and Otto Hahn served as gas troops in Harbour's unit. But probably the wounds from the Great War, they were still too fresh, and Harbour's prize was received as an outrage by the scientific community, especially in the US and the UK, where he was considered a war criminal. Professor Ernst Rutherford, father of nuclear physics, famously refused to shake Fritz Harbour's hand at a conference in Cambridge in 19. 19. Despite international isolation, Fritz Haber, he managed to keep himself busy. First, in 1919, he was appointed director of the newly founded Degush Company, and remember that name, that's a chemical manufacturer specializing in fertilizers and pesticides. And then came his next big project. The same way he had managed to make bread from air, Haber now devoted himself to turn water into gold. Or to be more correct, he wanted to extract gold from seawater. This was his attempt to support the recently established Weimar Republic by paying back Germany's war reparations to the Allied powers. Unfortunately, the concentration of gold in seawater turned out to be too scarce and the process to extract it was too costly. Despite all his efforts to serve his country as best he could, the German people would soon prove to be an ungrateful one. Let's not forget that dark forces were at work during the 1920s and early 1930s. As soon as the Nazis were voted into power, a new law was ratified in April 1933, which prevented Jews from holding positions in the civil service. Fritz Haber, at that time, he held the role of president of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physics and Electrochemistry. A smear campaign was launched to oust him, although he, as a convert and a former World War I decorated veteran, was legally entitled to keep his post. This did not apply, however, to his collaborators, three quarters of which were still Jews, and so he was simply ordered to fire them. In this case, Haber applied a form of silent resistance to Nazi prevarication and delayed their dismissal until he could find employment for each one of them. But Haber had realized that it was time to go. Between the summer of 1933 and early 1934, Fritz, his former wife Charlotte, and all of his children from both marriages all fled abroad 
and settled in the UK. Harbour was now suffering from cardiovascular disease, but when he was offered a directorship at a research institute in British Palestine, he eagerly accepted. Halfway through his journey in Basel, Switzerland, Fritz Harbour succumbed to a fatal episode of acute heart failure. It was the 29th of January, 1934. He was buried in the local cemetery, where his ashes were joined by Clara's remains three years later. Now, it is uncommon for us to continue our stories after the death of our main character, but what happened some years after Fritz Haber's demise is certainly worth telling. If you remember, back in 1919, Haber had been one of the founders of the Degesh chemical company dedicated to fertilizers and pesticides. One of their top-selling products, to which Haber had personally contributed, was in fact a very powerful pesticide for agricultural use and improvement on the existing hydrogen cyanide or prussic acid. It was enriched with absorbents and an eye irritant to act as a warning against leaks. It was used mainly for delousing purposes, until in August of 1941, an SS captain, Karl Friedrich, used it as a gassing agent to kill some Russian POWs. This came to the attention of Rudolf Hoss and other Nazi officials. They were looking for a solution to solve what they considered their ultimate problem. You would say that they were looking for a final solution. A cheap and efficient way to exterminate millions of Jews, Roma, and other undesirables. The pesticide was modified to remove its warning odor and its eye irritants so as to take the victims completely by surprise. The original name of the chemical? Well, that was Zyklon. Its modified version? The infamous Zyklon B, the preferred killing tool used by the Nazi delirium to end the lives of millions of innocent Jews and other prisoners in the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Malthusen, and Buchenwald. Among the countless dead were some of Fritz Haber's relatives. This was the last defining act of the tragedy of Fritz Haber, a Jew who renounced his faith to prove he was a worthy German and a man torn apart by his ambition, his devotion to the fatherland, and his inability to love those who were closest to him. Well, this is where we end today's biographics. I hope you enjoyed this episode, despite its rather dark themes. We'd love to hear about your views on Fritz Haber. Should we remember him as a genius scientist who prevented countless famines and truly deserving of a Nobel Prize, or as a callous monster who contributed to the disintegration of a heroine and to the horrors of modern warfare? Well, leave your comments below as usual. We do love a good debate. And if you want more stories like this, interesting, controversial, inspiring lives, well, please do click that subscribe button below. We put out new videos three times a week, so spare yourself the hassle of checking in and hit the bell icon so you're the first to know when we put out a new video. If you want to learn more about the Holocaust, watch our previous biographics episodes about Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the final solution, and why not check out our video about Timothy McVeigh, and maybe you can see the tenuous link between that American terrorist and our protagonist of today. Also, a big thanks to CuriosityStream for sponsoring 30 days for free. Click the link in the description below. And as always, thank you for watching.